Okay, so today we're going to continue ionic naming, and we're going to deal with two main kind of concepts with ionic naming. Last time we did binary compounds, but now we're going to move on to um, a little bit bigger compounds that are still ionic. Okay, so ionic still means that it contains a metal and at least one nonmetal. Okay, so for binary compounds, it was one of each. For um, bigger compounds, it's usually one metal and maybe multiple nonmetals. Okay, so that's kind of how it works. So we're going to look, start today by looking at your periodic table of ions, and I want you to look specifically at those transition metals. Do you see how some of those are split and they have multiple charges? Okay, what do you see right beside in parentheses for each of those that have multiple charges? Right, the Roman numeral. So we talked about what, why, what institutes uh, needing a Roman numeral, but that's going to be kind of one of our focuses today is these only ones that we need or that we use Roman numerals for is for elements that can have multiple charges. Okay, and so the reason they can have multiple charges is that they're stable enough to give away two electrons or stable enough to give away three. They're okay with doing that, and they can exist in either of those forms. So let's say at cobalt, okay, if I would talk about cobalt 2, that 2 Roman numeral automatically tells us that we're dealing with the cobalt that's a plus 2 charge. Okay, and if we deal with cobalt 3, that means we're automatically dealing with a plus 3 charge. Okay, so the, the charge makes a huge difference on the ratio of elements within a compound, right? If we want to combine cobalt with fluoride, let's say, and I wanted to use cobalt 2 fluoride, right, I would go COF2. If I was using cobalt 3, I'd have to go COF3, right? It changes the compound completely, which means it changes its characteristics completely, changes its properties completely. So knowing which version of these metals that you're dealing with is a big deal, okay? So anytime we are naming a compound that has a, a multiple charge, we have to use those Roman numerals in the written name, okay? And so they're written just like that with the parentheses, Roman numeral, and then you finish your, your um, name. So if I wanted to name this molecule right here, I would call it cobalt 2 fluoride, okay? So we're going to start by going from the name to the compound, and then we're going to go backwards, which is a little bit more difficult, okay? So let's say I'm looking at... Lead three sulfide. Lead three sulfide. Okay, it doesn't change a whole lot of what we're doing except this three tells us exactly what lead's charge is. Okay. And do you see how on your periodic table lead is okay, lead is PB. Have we located that yet? Okay. It says its charges are plus two or plus four, right? Not even plus three like I have up here. These on here are the most common charges you'll see, but always just trust what that Roman numeral tells you, okay? So even if it's not a possible charge on here, these are just the most common two listed. So I want you to just trust whatever's given to you in the problem like that, okay? So lead 3 sulfide would mean I start with Pb plus 3, and sulfide is S. What's the charge for S? Minus 2. Okay, so if I were going to combine those into a, into a formula, a chemical compound, what would be my final compound? Good, Pb2S3. What do you mean? No, no, 2 and 4 are lead's most popular charges. But plus 3 could also be a charge. It just not hap doesn't happen to be listed on here. So you're always just going to go with what that Roman numeral tells you. Okay. So it doesn't have to fall between those. That's not the case necessarily. Okay? So we got PB2S3 because we wanted our charges overall to be balanced. We can use our shortcut method, which means get rid of your signs and then cross them down. Okay? That's kind of our shortcut method, which gives us PB2S3. Okay? So if I would give you this molecule right here, the only name that would be acceptable is lead 3 sulfide. Right? We want to just say lead sulfide but then I don't know what version of lead that I'm working with. So that Roman numeral becomes extremely important, okay? Something else that I want you to think about is that you do not need to include a Roman numeral for elements that can only have one charge, okay? So for all of these others, 
that aren't split, you don't include the Roman numeral. It just is for ones that could have multiple charges. Okay, so does calcium need a Roman numeral? Yes or no? No, because what's calcium? The only possible charge. Plus two. Does nickel need a Roman numeral? Yes. Where's nickel at? Number 28. Okay, so nickel could have multiple charges, so it has to have a Roman numeral. Okay, so you need to differentiate which ones need them and which ones don't. Okay, let's try this one. Copper, one, chloride. Okay, so our final chemical formula should have been CuCl, right? Would we agree? If there's a 1 for each of those, we just leave them off, right? Whenever our subscript needs to be a 1, you just leave it, okay? So we only need a subscript if we need more than 1, okay? You want to try a couple on your own here? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at... Okay, so you couldn't have solved chromium nitride without a Roman numeral. So we, we're going to go ahead and add that 2 in there so you know which one to use. I just thought you forgot the Roman numeral. No, I did it on purpose. Yeah, yeah Monse, what would you have? S-N-O-2. S-N-O-2. Agreed? Because if you didn't reduce it, right, 10 would be plus 4. Oops, not 10. I'm losing it here. SN2O4. Okay, so both of these can be reduced by 2. So we need to go ahead and reduce that. So we're left with SNO2. Okay? All right, manganese 2 phosphide. Evan, what'd you have? Um, MG3P2. MG3P2, would we agree? No, that's magnesium phosphide. Oh, no. Manganese is MN. Oh. Yeah, that's all right. See, mag magnesium would not need a Roman numeral because it only has one charge, right? So that should have been a clue for you there. Manganese is MN. It's number 25. So what should our formula actually have been? It didn't change a whole lot except for that one letter. MN3P2. Right, so there's really only one difference in that, but uh, it is a big difference, okay? So MN3P2, very good. Chromium nitride, our last one. Natalie, what would you have? CR3N2. Perfect. We agree on all three of those? Anybody go three for three? Maybe. All right, good. Good, good. Adding in what are called polyatomic ions. And we talked a little bit about polyatomic ions last class and what they were. What does polyatomic ion probably mean? Right? What does it mean? We, we, we gave the definition for it last class a little bit. Multiple what? Multiple atoms that make an ion. Right? So multiple atoms that have a charge. And so on the top of your periodic table of ions is a box full of polyatomic ions. Full of them, okay? Those are things like, let's see, carbonate. Oops, I can't spell. Is carbonate on your? 
Okay, so carbonate has a formula of CO3 minus 2, right? It's multiple atoms that as a whole have a charge, okay? So polyatomic ions are most of the time, 99% of the time, right? And really all of the time that we're, no, okay, not all the time. 90% of the time are made up of nonmetals, okay? So this carbon, oxygen are both nonmetals, okay? And most of the time, our polyatomic ions have a negative charge, okay? There are two exceptions at the bottom of, your, of that table, and what are those two exceptions? Ammonium, which is NH4 plus 1, and hydronium, which is H3O plus, okay? There's more polyatomic ions that we're going to see and use, um, but we'll kind of stick to this list just for right now. So is there anything else listed under carbonate? What's, what's uh, next under carbonate? Mine's blacked out on here, so I don't have it. Chlorate. Okay. Okay, so there is a big difference between carbonate and carbonide. And chlorate, which is CLO, CLO3 minus 1. Okay, chlorate and chloride are two very different things. Right? Any, whenever it ends in an ATE, that means it has some oxygens attached to it. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean it's three oxygens attached to it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's four. It doesn't necessarily mean that, but it means there are oxygens attached to it. Okay? So I want you to look at... Hmm, it doesn't put many of those on here. Okay, I want you to look at nitrate and nitrite on your sheet. Nitrate... Is NO3 minus 1. What do you see nitrite is? NO2 minus 1. So the difference between an 8 and an ite is that we lose one oxygen atom. Where do you get the 1? Oh, the minus just means minus oh, 1. Okay. okay, so if they leave off the 1, that just means it's a 1. Okay, so the only difference between an 8 and an ite is you lose one oxygen. So I want you to write that down, whether it's on your periodic table of ions, whether it's in your notes, whatever it is, because on this sheet, there's a lot of 8s, carbonate, phosphate, um, chlorate, those are all listed, but the ite version of it is not, and I want you to have that, okay? So what happens between an 8 and an ite is that we lose one oxygen, but the good news is, is that the charge of the, of the compound does not change at all, okay? So it's still a negative one from all those, okay? Does that kind of make sense? So if you could be familiar with the eights or you can recognize the eights, you always will know what the ite is. Okay, so if I look at phosphate, phosphate is P-O what? Four. Minus 3, right? And they write them on your sheet as 3 minus. There's no difference to that. I always just will write minus 3, okay? So what would that make phosphite? Good, PO3 minus 3. Okay, the charge stays the same. You lose one oxygen, okay? And there are more tricks that go with much more polyatomic ions, but I'm, I'm not going to get to that um, Right now, we don't need to know that part just yet, okay? So that's going to be the kind of two types of uh, polyatomic ions that we really focus on, but we're going to build compounds with lots of these polyatomic ions up here, okay? The way we name with polyatomic ions is very simple, okay? I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of write you a little bit of a rule up here. So naming with polyatomic ions, it's really no different than what we've been doing. Okay, the cation gets to keep its name like normal. And the polyatomic ion gets to keep its name. Right, so it's not like we change these to end in IDE because Cl minus and ClO Three minus are two very, very different things, right? This is chloride, 
and this is chlorate. Right? And if we wanted to look at ClO2 minus, this would be chlorite. So we see how all of those look uh, name wise very similar chloride, chlorate, and chlorite. Right? They all look very similar, but they are way different compounds, which means they behave differently, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so do we understand the difference? If we have a, an ion on its own, that's when it ends in IDE. Okay, if we have an eight or an ite ending, that means we have oxygens attached to that anion. Okay, are we on the same page with that? Okay. So now our name is going to get a little bit more intense because we don't want to just have single atoms anymore. We might have polyatomic ions that go with it. Okay, so you're not only looking on the periodic table, you're looking in your box up here too for your anions. Okay. All right, let's try some naming with polyatomic ions. These are still considered ionic compounds, so this is no different. I'm just telling you we don't change the name of a polyatomic ion. Okay. So let's try uh, some simple ones here first. Let's start with... Um, sodium nitrate. Okay, sodium nitrate. Okay, so that is the full name of that compound. Okay, so I gave you the full written name. Doesn't need Roman numerals because sodium only has a one charge. Nitrate gets to keep its name because it's a polyatomic ion. So sodium is Na plus 1. Nitrate is NO3 minus 1. So how many of each of those do we need to give us a balanced formula? Just one of each, right? So our formula ends up being NaNO3. Okay, that's it. So we want one nitrate molecule and one sodium atom, okay, combined together. We will never change that subscript in nitrate. Never, never, never. The three is not something that can be reduced. Okay, listen to me say that one more time. The three is not part of anything that can be reduced, okay? So once you have a polyatomic ion, its formula never changes. Understood? So in a polyatomic ion, none of that stuff is reducible, okay? I'll show you how we can get um, reducible things outside of that, but we don't ever change a subscript of a polyatomic ion. Write it in big letters or, I don't know, whatever you need to do to remember that, but we don't change uh, subscripts in a polyatomic ion. Okay, let's look at calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide. Okay, so does this give us a balance right off the bat? No. What do we need? What do we need to help us get to a balanced ionic compound? I need two of what? I need two hydroxides, right? So the way we do that um, is like this: C A O H parentheses two. Okay. So if we need more than one of a polyatomic ion we have to include parentheses, okay? Because if I don't, right, let's say I just use my simple cross-down method, which still works fine. If I just use this method, it might leave us looking like this, CaOH2, in which case, how many, um, what, what's the two telling us we need two of? just hydrogens. And that's not the real truth, right? We know we need two hydroxide molecules. So when we need more than one of a polyatomic ion, we put parentheses around the outside. So that won't work because we need the two to be distributed through the whole thing. Okay? On the same page there? Maybe? Okay. Let's try a couple more. Let's try here... Um,
magnesium phosphate. You want to try this one on your own? You want to do it together? All right. I'll let you try it on your own. I'm going to write up here on the board, but I um, <clears throat> will do it quietly. So if you're doing it on your own, just don't look up. If you're stuck, look up and I can help you. Anybody get it on their first try? Yeah? Good. Okay, something that um, I want you to think about is that when we finish our product, we don't write like this, MG3P2O8, right? That's, we don't go ahead and distribute that two, right? We want to show that we need two phosphate at, uh, molecules, okay? So we don't want to distribute that two throughout. We're just going to say we need a phosphate. It's bonded to phosphate, and there's two of them. Okay. The four means that there are four oxygens attached to a phosphorus. Okay, so if I were to draw it, it would look like this. Okay, and each of those oxygens has electrons around it, and it has to do with each of them wants to have an octet, and so that's where the minus three comes from, and we're going to look at that next chapter. But um, that's why it's written PO4, because there are four oxygens bonded to that phosphorus. Okay. Alright, let's try a couple here on your own. Um, let's see here. I'm going to make you work on this one a little bit. A lead four sulfite. Let's see if we can pull out all the stops on this one. Okay, everything you learned today is coming into this one. I'm going to walk around, so if you have questions, let me know. How many of you had it like this? PB2, uh, oh, 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 sorry, sorry, it would have been a little more uh, interesting if I would have done it right the first time. What would you say? Oh, yeah, so these need to be reduced. So how many of you started out with this one? Okay, that means you're really close, right? The only thing that we missed there was reducing those, okay? And so when we have a subscript outside the parentheses, that is reducible, okay? But inside the parentheses or attached to a polyatomic ion, non-reducible, okay? Okay, so let's say that I have... Um, We'll just start with that one. FEP. I'll fix it here in just a second. Sorry. FEP is our formula, and I want you to give me the written name. Okay, FEP. So we'll, we'll work through together, but yeah, this is tough because you have to figure out which version of iron that you're working with. Okay? Okay, so the way you go about it is if you know you're working with phosphide, phosphide only has one charge, right? And what's its charge always? Minus three. And if it's a one-to-one -one ratio, what does iron's charge have to be? Three. Plus three. So that means our final um, 
answer should have been iron 3 phosphide. Tricky, huh? Okay, so working backwards from our formula takes a little bit more work because we've got to figure out which version are we using, and then you have to make sure you include that from a numeral. Okay, does that make sense how we got backwards from that? Okay, start with your anion because your anion never changes charges. Okay, let's try another one here. Uh, let's see. This one is using a polyatomic ion now. Okay, you can do it. Just take your time. You can do it. All right, so just by looking at it without the Roman numeral or anything, you know this should be called nickel oxide, hydroxide, right? Yeah. But we have to put that Roman numeral in there. Did we figure out what the Roman numeral for nickel should be? Three. Plus three. Good, good, very good, okay? Because if we know hydroxide is minus one and there's three of them, that gives us a minus three, so here we need to have a plus three for nickel. Okay, you could also work with your reverse system of crossing the charges. You just cross them back up, right? That would leave us with Ni plus 3 and OH minus 1, right? So if you were use that crossing method and that works better for you, you can always reverse that. Sometimes when it's reduced, then those get a little tricky. But uh, if it's not been reduced, then, uh, then it works well. Okay, questions here? You ready to try out some on your own? All right, I'm going to give you quite a few here to try on your own. Um, what do we need more practice with? Roman numerals, polyatomic ions, both, just a combination of both? Okay, all right, so I'm going to kind of mix everything up here. I'm going to give you the compound. Sometimes I'll give you the name. I'm going to throw it all out there, okay? Okay, got four up here. Take your time, ask questions if you have them. Evan, what you got? AG3PO4. AG3PO4, you're close, but there's PO3. one thing. PO3, because it's phosphite, we got to take away one oxygen from phosphate. Okay, so it should have been AG3PO3, or phosphite. So these are not reducible because PO3 is part of the phosphite. Okay, so imagine if you had parentheses here, even though you don't need them, right? Nothing inside the parentheses could be reduced. Okay, so we don't change the subscript on a polyatomic ion. Okay, so if you put the parentheses, you put wrong. Uh, yeah, technically. So how do you know it doesn't make sense? So it doesn't need a parentheses? You, 
that's right. You only need the parentheses if you need more than one polyatomic ion. Okay, so if we needed more than one phosphite, we would put the parentheses. But since we only need one phosphite and three silvers, Ag3PO3. So non-reducible. That's okay. Okay, second one. The written name. Hannah, what did you have? Manganese 2 sulfide. Manganese 2 sulfite. I would agree. Wait, isn't that a 3? That's what I thought. No, sulfite is SO3. That's as a whole. Sulfite oh. has a minus 2 charge. So you got to be really careful. You have to identify where your polyatomic ions is. So this is a full polyatomic ion that had a minus 2 charge. Just like manganese had a plus 2 charge. Okay. <laughs> you can do it. Once we put those polyatomic ions in there, you have to really identify where the polyatomic ion starts and where it stops. Okay. All right, next one, calcium chloride. This should be an easy one. What was it? Good, CaCl2. Calcium chloride. IDE means it's just the atom itself. Not chloride, no oxygens, no nothing. Okay, chloride. Good. Last one. All right, Eduardo, what do you think? Copper uh, broken. You're close. What are we missing? Copper one bromate because copper could have more than one charge, so you have to include the Roman numeral. Very close. Anybody? Anybody go? For